Welcome everybody to the virtual WebMax 2022. My name is Diane Crilly and I am the director of MA programs and I manage and work with the WebMax committee and putting on your WebMax each year. Today we will share what was discussed and learned at each of the three in-person WebMaxes. I would like to recognize Craig Kelman and associates for the continued sponsorship to WEF programs. We also thank our speakers today, Jamie Eichenberger, Christy Steiner, Alicia Suzuki, Nishida Noreen, Lauren McKnight, Danelle Duncan, and Joe Navis for leading and sharing with us today. So let's get started. I would like to introduce WEF President Jamie Eichenberger. Jamie is an Associate Vice President and Senior Project Manager with HDR in Denver. He has been active with WEF since college. As a member of the Rocky Mountain WEA, he has served as their president, WEF delegate, and has also served as the WEF House of Delegates speaker. Jamie has a bachelor's and master's degree in environmental engineering from the Colorado School of Mines. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Jamie. Great, thank you, Diane. Um, it, as Diane mentioned, uh, I, I'm a past president of Rocky Mountain WEA, so I got my start at the uh, MA level and um, before joining the House Delegates and uh, being speaker back in, I think, 2015, which is longer ago than I like to admit now. But um, just want to say that uh, that experience really <laughs> highlights the importance of our member associations um, and our, our member association leadership. So I just want to say a big thank you to all of you for everything that you do. You're really on the front line with our members um, and the ones that can best demonstrate the value that, that WEF um, and your member associations are bringing. Um, and to, uh, to be able to come together through these WEF Max events, I think is really important. So hopefully many of you got to attend some of the in-person ones as well as this virtual format. Um, but we're trying something a little new this year. Uh, Stephen was kind enough to invite me last year as we went through a reimagining WEF Tech, um, or sorry, reimagining WEF Max uh, exercise with many of the people on this call. Um, I'm sure I'll miss a few, but looking at the folks that are on my screen, um, uh, <clears throat> Stephanie Farrell, Stephen Drankschult, and others were on that. And we were able to look at ways to better engage everybody and really keep people involved. And we got overwhelmingly positive feedback on the changes that, uh, that happened this year. Like being able to focus and really do a little bit more of a deeper dive um, on specific topics at the three in-person WEF maxes, um, being able to uh, provide more time for networking and partnering some people up through kind of a mentorship program as we went through, just allowed people to make the best of their time together. So uh, for those that were able to attend, hope you had a great time. Um, for those that weren't able to attend, um, please please plan on attending the WEF Maxes in person next year. I think you you get a ton out of it. I know there's some of my favorite events to um, uh, to attend throughout the year, and I was uh, disappointed I didn't didn't get to make it to any of them this year. But happy to be here with you today for the virtual WEF Max. Um, with that, I wanted to move into a quick presentation on our um, strategic plan and kind of where we're at with that process right now. So let me see if I can share my screen here. All right. Can folks see my screen now? I'll assume silence is accepted yes. on this one. Yep. So, um, so the first thing I really wanted to touch on is just why we go through um, this whole uh, whole strategic planning process. Now. And I know many of our member associations, many of you all have gone through this process at your own MAs over the last few years. Um, historically, this has been kind of on a five-year cadence as we go through. Um, that's That's been kind of standard on strategic planning. These days, we're seeing more of a, um, like a three-year cadence, not necessarily throwing the whole thing out and starting from scratch but really looking at those updates a little more frequently, just due to how fast the world is changing around us. But what we found through the research is that having um, in particular that strong mission and vision um, really allows us to drive results as an organization. We're seeing 30% increases in innovation, nine times the customer satisfaction when you're talking about uh, in organizations that have a clear mission and vision. And um, for those of you that have staff, but I think this applies with members as well, you know, big retention, uh, big boost in retention of the people that are engaged with the organizations. 
I, I think that's because we're all stretched pretty thin these days um, between family commitments, other organizations we're involved with, um, you know, that pesky day job. Uh, there's a lot going on and trying to figure out where to spend your time. You really want to spend it somewhere that has impact. So a strong strategic plan can really help set that North Star, set the direction for the organization and allow you to really be focused on what impact, what outcomes you're having. So we started this process um, for WEF at the national level a little over a year ago, and um, we engaged a consultant through consulting, um, who I've poached most of these slides for, from, so thank you through, uh, to help us through this process. And we really wanted to start from scratch. It had been a little over a decade since we had, had done our last strategic plan, our last major update. We have had a couple of updates over that time, uh, hey, most recently in 2018. Call. But um, I'm pretty good. Yourself? We are um, uh, we are in the process of, of looking at this from the beginning. So we wanted to start with an assessment phase, and we spent kind of our first three, four months really going through that, understanding where we are in the market, getting a lot of feedback from our members um, and our different stakeholders, and then moved in the envisioning phase, really the spring of this year, working on developing our mission and vision statement. And we've been spending the last uh, few months really working through the plan and putting together a three-year outcome statement, um, some uh, strategic goals and some key metrics to make sure that we're able to measure that as we go through. Right now, we are all but done with the plan. Um, we just had our summer board meeting last week, uh, wrapped up on Saturday, and um, are, are just about there. We have a final virtual meeting uh, this, this coming Monday where we're gonna finalize the plan and then we're going to um, start on the activation, making sure that we're able to implement it and, um, and do all that. We will have a session uh, on August 11th, and I'll have a slide at the end here with some more information on that. But that'll be a, a virtual town hall event that you're all invited to. Um, we'll also be recording that, so it'll be available, but giving a bit of a sneak peek to all of our member association leaders, our volunteer leadership, um, the WEF staff, to be able to get out ahead of it a little bit, and then we'll have a big rollout at WEF Tech this year. So one of the things I really wanted to highlight is that um, while, while we've, we as a board have been the ones kind of driving the development of this plan, there's really a plan for you and for our members. So what we wanted to do was um, go and make sure we had strong outreach and input from our WEF leadership, from our members, from some key stakeholder groups uh, that, that we work with as we crafted this. So we had a number of interviews with some of the groups shown here. Um, we had several focus groups. Many of these happened at WEF Tech 2021 in Chicago, and I'm sure some of you were members of those groups. And then we had a member survey where we got feedback from about 700 of our members. In addition to um, kind of that member feedback, one of the other things we really wanted to make sure we did was uh, look, look outside of our own bubble. And so we pulled together a group of leaders from um, both inside and outside the water industry. Some of these were association leaders, some of these were business leaders, um, and we wanted to kind of talk to them about what they're seeing is most important to their um, organizations, what trends and drivers they're seeing in um, the market as a whole, and how things have been changing, especially as we come out of, um, you know, the, the COVID pandemic and, and all of that. So we called this our, our luminary group, and we had a luminary session where we got some feedback from those folks that uh, helped us further refine some of our messaging. Coming out of that, we got some key points of things that we do well and things that people want to see us um, continue or, or do better on moving forward. And kind of three key areas there. First and foremost, WEF has a real strength in being conveners. We bring people together to collaborate and solve some really challenging problems. Um, part of that is that uh, we are, frankly, a little easier to work with than some other organizations in the water space. And we want to maintain some of that flexibility um, and some of that ability to just uh, be nimble and be able to um, work with different folks, bring them together, um, and, and just make sure that we're really focusing on solving the problems and not necessarily who's getting the credit or you know, um, who's, who's doing that, but, but help to bring people together to, to lead some of that change. Um, problem solvers. Uh, we're very good at focusing um, on the expertise of our staff, of our volunteers, of our um, industry to be able to solve some of these big challenges. 
And then finally, leaders. And this is one that I think we heard a little more WEF should be um, than WEF is on, on this one, but something where we should take a little more um, a little more leadership role, really step out in front of some of these and make sure that we're driving some of the changes that we need to see in our sector to be successful and some of the changes we need to see within our organization to make sure that WEF is just as strong 50, 100 years from now as it has been for its last 100 years. Our luminary sessions um, help further refine some of the input that we got. And there are, there are three kind of key takeaways here. And one um, ties into that purpose and belonging. And um, in my first slide, where I was talking about why do strategic planning, I think a lot of this came into it. People really want to feel that sense of purpose and meaning um, in where they're spending their time. And they want to feel like they belong to um, the, these organizations. Um, so, you know, beyond just being a member, really feeling like you're part of an engaged community. Um, the second one, and this one's probably my favorite, is the outcomes versus outputs. What impact are we having? What actual change are we driving as an organization versus what kind of um, materials are we putting out there? So um, a lot of times it's easy for us to say that, um, you know, focus on the outputs. Well, we held a conference. Well, we, we published a new fact sheet. Well, we published a new manual of practice. And those, those may be the things we need to be doing, but really making sure that those are um, driving the outcomes that we want to see that we are getting a more diverse and inclusive um, workforce in the water sector, um, that we are really um, helping to move the needle on resource recovery. Um, looking at those types of outcomes and making sure that what we're doing is supporting those and we're not just putting them out because that's what we've always done. And that really ties in this third point too, that um, form needs to follow function. We need to make sure that we um, kick ourselves out of some of the ruts that we may have dug in. And that um, my goal, um, put simply, is I never want to hear, like when someone asks why we're doing something, well, because we've always done it that way. We want to make sure that we're really um, rearranging the organization and how we work together to be able to drive that. So with all that, um, what we're going to end up with is this three-year strategy map. And so we'll have our mission, our vision, our three-year outcome statement, and then goals, metrics, and strategies that are really driving that forward. We want to look in this three-year time frame. We felt like that was the right time to get in um, and then reevaluate this, see what, um, uh, what type of progress we've made, and then make any readjustments that we need to. And then underlying all of these are cultural values. And these cultural values are going to have, um, I think, a, a noticeable and significant shift in how the organization operates where we focus and how we interact with our members and our other stakeholders. Um, so ending where we began, I just wanted to pop this up again. We are finishing up the planning phase right now, moving into activation. We'll have this big rollout at WEF Tech. But before that, I did want to throw out the save the date for all of you. Hopefully, everyone on this call received an email um, from, I think came from Water Environment Federation, uh, but with a letter from me inviting you to the town hall. Um, it will be taking place on August 11th from 2 to 2.45 Eastern time. And we'll be going through the values, the mission vision, our three-year outcomes, um, and, and our goals as part of this, uh, uh, as part of this town hall. We want to give you all kind of a sneak peek before the big public rollout and ask for your help in being ambassadors to help us move this message forward. Um, so with that, I am done with my portion of the presentation. And I believe we are moving on into the um, next step here. Diane, I had my agenda up in front of me and realized yes, it, I closed it. So what? At this point in time, we are going to move into our WEFMAX recap and uh, turn it over to Christy Steiner. Awesome. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen. I lost the people, so I can't see you, unfortunately, but hopefully you can see my screen here. Um, so as you can see from these photos, and thank you to Lance and Alicia, because these came from them, uh, we had a blast in Hawaii. And thank you again to Hawaii for hosting, because they really did a great job of making us all feel like family while we were there. Um, while we were in Hawaii, we focused on water communications. So after a night of informal communication through scavenger hunting and networking, we kicked things off with family feud as an icebreaker. And we learned through a survey that was done at a 
in advance of the HOD delegates that some of the greatest barriers to participating in WEF are time and funding or company support. No real surprise there. Um, but we also learned that people feel the top services missing are better support from WEF for facilitating sharing and communication across our member associations. Um, so that we also explored WEF's brand and kind of the perception in the room around water communications through a World Cafe exercise with questions like, how would you describe WEF to a coworker? This was super positive. It was career changing, worth it and community. Um, but we also asked what comes to mind when you think of water communications. And that was a little more across the board, like poor marketing, like toilet to tap that kind of draws some not so nice imagery and more technical communication like CSO and boil advisories. Um, so maybe work on the marketing, but we're good at the technical stuff. Um, we then really jumped in to start our communications journey with branding. And we learned about branding and how it is far more than just a logo because it represents who you are in this case as a member association. So it conveys your mission, your vision, your values. It is the experience that you want to create for your members. It's the thoughts and the feelings that you wanna be evoking when they hear your name or when they see your written communications. And it's really what makes you unique as an MA. So we learned that communication is really where MA brand begins and that all of your communications need a target audience to be effective because if it is for everyone, it won't reach anyone. And thank you, Stephen, for hammering that home several times. Um, we will never forget that phrase. So we then heard from Nishida on Arizona WEA's efforts around their communications planning. Um, and then we dove more into implementation. Um, Casey Allard and Hannah Fodder walked us through how Rocky Mountain WEA developed their communication strategy and a little more about the process behind implementing their plan's vision, um, which is very complicated and time consuming. They shared some of the videos that came out of that um, that they had developed to communicate their messages to target audiences. And I think before the end of the WEFMAX, we should be able to drop those in, just links to those into the chat maybe. Um, definitely worth checking out. So after a break for lunch and our brains, because it was a lot, Dr. Jenny Rutherford and Valerie Lucas wrapped us up day one, leading us through an introduction to something called liberating structures. Uh, which really focuses on breaking free from these go-to microstructures like traditional presentations, managed discussions, and brainstorming sessions um, that we fall back on for group collaboration, but that aren't always necessarily super effective for engaging an entire group. So breaking free from these and using one or like even a series of the 35 liberating structures uh, can boost engagement and participation in groups of any size. So you pick one to fit your need. Um, and Dr. Jenny Rutherford expertly demonstrated this. Um, she demonstrated two of the liberating structures for us, a celebrity interview of Valerie Lucas with clean water professionals of Kentucky and Tennessee um, that allowed Valerie to share their rebranding journey through an interview rather than a traditional PowerPoint presentation. And then we used a one, two, four, all exercise to capture individual audience questions uh, that they had for Valerie and convince them all through this really interactive exercise into a much shorter number of detailed questions. And it captured the group's thoughts at, that led to some really great conversations. And so we wrapped up that day and headed off to a luau, which you can also see on the slide. Again, we had lots of fun in Hawaii. Um, and then we came back day two, which was after some general web updates, more focused on hearing specific examples from member associations and what they're doing to advance communications. Um, and today we get to hear from our host MA in Hawaii, about their dedicated efforts to improving communications. So I'm excited to introduce Alicia Suzuki. Um, she is the current president of Hawaii 
Water Environment Association. And when she's not working on improving their communications, uh, she loves solving client challenges through water and wastewater designs for Kennedy Jinks. Alicia, I'll hand it over to you. Hey, um, I think you need to stop your screen share. So. Yeah, I would say, I don't know how to stop sharing them. <laughs> Might be at the top. I don't see how it is. There you go. Thanks. Share. All right. I assume that you can see my screen. Um, so thank you everyone for having me. Thank you, Christy, um, for giving a great recap of our time in Hawaii. Um, I'm grateful to be representing HWA and meeting all of you virtually. So I'll be sharing about whole, uh, HWA's communication avenues and the various media, media that we use and debatably effective ways that we communicate with our members and share an example of a resource we use to um, that we use to share externally um, when our audience is public outreach. So as Stephen reminded us during WEFMAX, uh, if the audience is everyone, your impact is no one. And so we have a lot of various communication methods to be able to meet our or reach our targeted audiences at our at these frequencies. Um, some messages are better delivered as a quick photo or some should be read as a news article. So this list just um, shows the different platforms that I'll go through and their uh, frequencies that we uh, try to hit. Um, so these are our primary modes of communication for our members. Um, MailChimp is our email, what we use for email blast. And it's good because it, from your email blast, you can post to Facebook and Instagram through it. So it makes it just one step less to um, have to deal with. Um, and our social media, even though it's available publicly, it, the content is targeted for our members. So for example, we had a ocean day um, and it was to thank our members for keeping our oceans clean rather than more of a broad scope um, for the public. And then YouTube is our newest uh, social media platform. And we're trying to increase inclusivity because a lot of our, member, or our members are across all islands. So it's hard to travel to the events where primarily we're located on Oahu. Um, so we're able to archive past presentations for those that couldn't attend in person. Um, we're working on branding consistency, which was one of the things that we learned at West Max Hawaii. And I'm really excited and thankful that HWA was awarded the WEF MA grant uh, to work with a consultant to, to get our branding consistent, which will help deliver our message better. Um, and I'll share that once we, uh, uh, what is it called? Once we have developed that. So we use Canva as our graphic design platform um, to create catchy flyers for people to click on and actually go to our website. This is just examples of, these are examples of content that we've developed through Canva. So if a post starts like this as a template, you're able to create something that looks like your brand and be more consistent. So these are the, the templates, which really helps develop it. Um, and then this is just a list of um, free images, sources, and other types of graphic design platforms. I just happened to have come across Canva first. So we had started using that. Our website is where members look for or are directed to to get detailed information. So registration, more information about um, conferences, look up what archive or and archive information um, versus emails are really trying to be short and sweet. Social media posts are very short and sweet. Um, our audience for this is generally the members, but our public education committee, because this is uh, publicly available, they were able to put their educational resources on our website um, so they can refer the public to come here and look for things. We host um, luncheons to provide technical training and that really important face-to-face -face contact uh, with our members. 
And this slide just shows examples of presentations. It's over lunch, come hang out, listen, and then also get the opportunity to network. Um, the ones that have like government officials at it get really high attendance if anyone wants to plan one. Our newsletter is named Lua Line because Lua generally means toilet in Hawaiian. And it looks amazing thanks to our Westmax sponsor, uh, Craig Kelman and Associates. Uh, we share even more details um, in the newsletter and it's a great way to archive the really great things the organization has done. So like um, our past conferences, we put a post in there and then now you have this nice copy that looks really nice of all the things we've done. Conferences are generally our major event and we have a lot of participation in them. Um, we have one large conference that's joint with um, AWWA Hawaii and a couple specialty um, HWA focused conferences. And this is where a lot of our members get uh, operator members see their value out of HWA because they're able to get their um, continuing education credits for their license. Our committees also are very important communicators for our organization and their communication looks different. So the uh, public education, they'll make a booth at um, various events to share about um, our industry. <clears throat> and like uh, messages like unflushables. Um, the student affairs, their communications are, for example, when they do um, um, scholarships that helps communicate the profession and get people uh, interested. And then young professionals are very good at communicating over food and drink. And I, this is a plug for Lance Manave, which I know that many of you have met and love. And this, he was able to get the city where he works for now to um, host this um, tour at the, a local wastewater treatment facility that um, to get students exposed about the career. And it's really just great because he spearheaded this effort with um, his colleagues to put on this event. So it wasn't through HWA, but I'm gonna take credit because Lance is our member. And then this next section, I'll just quickly go through these slides. Um, you can see the contrast of what, how we communicate to our members versus how we communicate to the public. And so thank you to Kyle Yukimoto for developing this content. Um, so this freshwater is an unlimited resource. This is a concept that we're trying to help the public um, understand it's these slides are very um, picture based just to be very capturing I use these actually at an outreach event for students so for them to kind of understand these concepts lots of pictures is helpful talk from it um, I actually the event was outside so they ended up being printed on these large um, on like 11 by 17 behind me and it just helps them see, understand, um, getting from, you know, toilet to, not toilet to tap, but like where we get our water from and then what, how your water gets delivered to you. <clears throat> this thing got a facelift recently, so I'm just clicking through because uh, it's more of the content that I wanted you to share with you. Um, oops, went back first. Uh, that it's, Try to be consistent through the presentation so it's not distracting, helps. Um, lots of photos, like these students don't know what these things are and just getting them exposed to uh, at a high level so that they ask more questions, become more interested um, is kind of our goal here. I think there is. So I'll take them all the way through water reuse, um, which was pretty interesting to these kids that I did it to recently. And then also throw in the remind your parents not to throw grease down the drain. I think we're almost done here. And this was not from a picture from West Max Hawaii, but it's what it looks like every day here. So I will turn it over to Nishita next, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. 
at all. All right. Um, thanks, Alicia. I am going to share my screen. And we are going to talk about um, Can you all see my screen? I'm assuming that's a yes. I haven't heard anything otherwise. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to um, thank Diane for uh, helping us organize all of this. It's a great way to remind us of all the work that we did with the WEFMAX and all the takeaways that we had and um, the action items that came out of this. Um, our, the South Carolina WEFMAX was focused on engagement of emerging professionals, emerging leaders within WEF and their MAs. Um, it, it basically comes out of like the HOD work group, um, WEF and their associated MAs uh, rely on new leaders to join like committees and um, HOD and the MA boards um, and other leadership opportunities. But in order to do that, um, WEF also recognizes that, you know, we need to have pathways and um, remove any hurdles or challenges that there may be um, to engage these emerging professionals. And keeping like the purposes in mind, um, as you can see on the screen, we, um, Jeff Berlin and I, built the agenda, um, kind of breaking it up into identified hurdles and challenges. Um, what are the current efforts? What are the current success stories um, that WEF is doing at like a national, um, international level um, in order to engage emerging professionals and what's happening at like local MAs. Um, and we've heard, and we heard great success stories. We heard, you know, everything from like outreach events to leadership academies that are very focused on trying and providing all of the resources available to these members in order to be successful as leaders within their MAs. And, um, and that kind of goes back to the creating of pathways um, that were that was identified as one of the purposes. Um, with what we are doing well, um, we also have to dive into what we can do better, um, where the gaps are, and um, what we need to improve on and what we need to focus on. So we spent um, the second half of the first day kind of diving into potential solutions and developing like next steps and action items. Um, a lot of these were brainstorming sessions. They were very interactive activities. Um, and I mean, for me, my biggest takeaway of that was there really is no one big solution that will resolve a lot of things, but there definitely are approaches that we can implement in order to find or customize a solution for your MA. Um, and for, I, I think what surprised us, all of the participants, um, is the, the very big surprise happened at the start of the first day where we started talking about hurdles and we were talking about um, how we can identify which hurdles to focus on and it completely threw us for a loop and we will talk a little bit more about that in a second. But I did want to um, focus on the identified hurdles and this is important because we have to first recognize what we need to resolve before we can resolve it. So as you can see on the screen, these were the hurdles that were identified by the HOD work group um, with regards to lack of engagement from our emerging leaders or emerging professionals. We saw how a lot of this does apply to pretty much to across the board, just engagement 
irrespective of the years of experience within our industry or sector. Um, and this was something that was surveyed by the HOD through various member groups and demographics. So we, um, the HOD had surveyed the UIPL group. So there was a, there's a workshop for emerging leaders at the YP summit. Um, the WEF Student and Young Professionals Committee has been surveyed. Um, same with the House of Delegates and WEF Max um, at Charleston. And just as a heads up, the WEF Max Charleston completely threw us out for a loop with when the results came out. And um, I would like to introduce Lauren McKnight um, to talk a little more about that. Um, she is a project engineer for Black and & Beach and is a member of the South, Car South Carolina section. Um, she's currently the chair of the South Carolina section's joint YP uh, committee. And uh, she was also one of the participants at the South Carolina WEF Max. And um, she got to attend it through a WEF grant, uh, through the WEF grant program. So um, with that, I will let Lauren speak. Are you yeah, on? Thanks. Thanks, Nishida. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to kind of come on. Uh, like Nishida mentioned, this was my first WEF Max that I attended, and I am a, a local to Charleston, South Carolina, so it was fun being able to be in my hometown for it. But um, yeah, so with this WEF Max, it was centered around why. It says that I'm muted. Can you guys hear, hear me? Okay, oh, great. It said that I, I was put on mute, but then I'm sorry. But anyways, uh, we, our section actually, since it was centered around YPs, thought it would be very important to have us there. And I think a couple of other sections as well, uh, hopefully those YPs decided to join today too. I believe there was one from Canada, there were others um, more in the United States, and we actually became very good friends after that. We became friends on LinkedIn, all of that stuff, but we kind of at first stayed together in like a group of four or five of us, and surprisingly it was all girls, which was cool to see, but anyways, the, the WEF Max started out, like Nishida was saying, where we we're able to see what hurdles WEF or those groups that had already done these polls really identified as these hurdles to get more YPs engaged. And that's what you're seeing on the screen here. So they thought that the number one issue that the YPs were having is the lack of awareness of opportunities. Uh, the second being lack of apparent support or invitation to join third and, and so on. There was actually two third places, so same cost and then lack of clear objectives. So this was presented to the group at WEF Max, and then they asked us to participate in the poll ourselves. And those results were relatively the same. So again, the first being lack of awareness, that's what all attendees felt like YPs were missing the most. Um, lack of apparent support or invitation to join. And then uh, this number four, but the third that they chose, lack of perceived value, that, that kind of comes to play in, in a second. And, you know, we're, we're newer to the group. So there was a table of just YPs. And I believe, so it was just YPs and then a past WEF president. And I just randomly mentioned like, wow, those were my bottom three. And they were all like, well, you need to say something. Well, I'm new, this is my fir first WEF Max. So we were kind of just talking and other YPs are agreeing with me. And so this past president is like, okay, we need to do just the YPs now. So we did that and um, those results showed that the number one issue that at least we were seeing was the need for existing leadership to embrace emerging professionals as leaders in the WEF community. And I think Nishida kind of touched on that a little bit, being that this, this industry in general, you don't learn this in school. This is over years and years of 
industry knowledge, there's history there. People don't actually know what we do. It's, it, you know, we're, we're first responders, but we weren't even mentioned as first responders during COVID. Yeah. So uh, I think that YPs are, could be a little bit intimidated by not being 15 years of experience. Like you just saying that, oh, okay, he knows what he's talking about one year of experience no sorry i don't want you do designing my plan you know so that was our number one and then number two was lack of resources which the number one for the other the people who are actually involved in the association or have been for a while was lack of awareness of opportunities so i think that that plays hand in hand uh yps are saying yeah, we don't know how to get to those resources. And then people who have been involved say, yeah, they don't know where to get the resources. Um, so I thought that was conjoined, like that That made a lot of sense. And then the third, lack of a parent support or invitation to join. And I think that that, that played a role in our number one for the YPs of the need for existing leadership to embrace emerging professionals. I think that because this is such a historical, like you just have to have so much knowledge and uh, you people really value that you've been in the industry a long time. And so I feel like there's a little bit of a pay your dues type of mentality. Um, not everyone feels that way. And it's just some people, I feel like, there's ways to do things. There's steps that you need to take. And if you don't take those steps and you just jump, people are perceiving you a little bit differently. Maybe they, they find you a little less appealing. Um, but so from those poll results that automatically started out with conversation of, well, how do we fix it? And so they actually brought all of the YPs up to the front of the room and we just got questioned. So it was just like, what, what can we do? How do we help you? And one of the biggest thing is, well, we can't get YP, like we can try to help YPs, but they don't want our help. They don't want to get involved in the association. So it's that lack of perceived value. And so uh, they, they identified, if you could go back to that last slide, Nishida, um, the lack of awareness of opportunities. And so I think that that plays a role into that unaware of the value that the association plays into your opportunities. I know for me, myself, I actually just started with Black and Beach in December, and that's because I met my new boss through WEF. So uh, I think that if people get involved and actually stay involved, they, they start to see the opportunities, but the, it's not just going to come automatically. Um, so that brings us to our first kind of discussion. We talked about what is the definition of the hurdle? So are these resources, if we say that they're there, are they available to someone who's never seen the website before? How are, are they able to navigate to these different places and if they are, are they able to do it by themselves or does somebody need to tell them how to navigate? Um, so with that, we, we wanted to kind of give ourselves some potential solutions that can help just to discuss. We mentioned targeted messaging, micro volunteering and identifying champions. So within our presentation, so each YP was kind of called upon to give what, what their YP committees are doing within their individual MAs. And some of them said, well, we appoint a YP to be on every committee. Every committee within our MA has a YP representative and so they come back to the YP meetings and discuss what's going on in the association. We're doing this volunteer opportunity with water charities. You should get involved. We're doing this 5K. So the YPs are really knowledgeable of everything going on in their specific MA. The other thing that people were doing was getting more involved with social media. So I know specifically with South Carolina MA, we actually do a LinkedIn page 
as well as GroupMe. We have virtual meetings as well as our in-person meetings. And then um, we do YP highlights. So YPs like recognition. We all want to be acknowledged that we're doing a great job. We want to keep moving forward. So if a YP and RMA is doing a great job, we, we feature them on LinkedIn. It's a great opportunity for employers to see it. It's a great opportunity for them to share it. Um, just to kind of, I feel like a lot of people who've been involved in the association previously don't realize that you may have already built your resume. And as much as this is a nonprofit organization, we're still building our resume. Like we, these things are important to us and to not feel acknowledged is something that could really hurt YP involvement. And so if we can go to the next. Yeah, so that was the lack of apparent support. So employers do not understand the value, uh, intimidation and fear. Then there's just a bias. I talked about that just industry bias of I put in my time, so you're going to have to do the same. I worked, it took me five years to get here, so you're going to have to do your five years of time. Uh, invitation to join. So I know I personally, whenever I got out of college, I had a great mentor. My boss was very involved, which is why I got involved. But other people who have never heard of the association or don't have that support need to be invited by someone as well. So what, what potential solutions do we have for that? And we specifically talked about a mentor-mentee program. And this was actually initiated, or I guess not, it's been done before, but it was also implemented in the Charleston WEF Max. So if you were a first WEF Max attendee, you actually were assigned a mentor. And my mentor was awesome. He was the first person that I met. And I will say it was a lot easier because you always have that go by. Uh, I did, I was lucky enough to have another YP that I showed up with, but it was very nice to kind of talk. We had similar interests. He kind of shared some papers that he wrote um, and he's all the way in Arizona. So I would have never made that connection if it wasn't for being assigned that mentor. Uh, so it, we identified a bunch of different potential solutions, but one of the other hurdles that was a big topic of discussion was the embracing, needing for the existing leadership to embrace those professionals. So you may say, well, I'm doing, I embrace them. I I reach out every once in a while, but I feel like it's a little bit more than just reaching out once or twice. I feel like it's more of a, of a relationship base. So one of the things we also found out is none of the YPs knew delegates. We didn't know what a delegate at large was. We didn't know any of that, that, that structure. And so I felt, and I didn't, I, I mean, I asked several people, like, how does that correlate? Like, how does that work? And I was like, well, oh, well, I feel like the delegates, like mostly, they, they should be the one really fostering the relationships because they know how to do it. Obviously, they're in the spot they are because they're very involved. They know who to contact if you have any issues. And just speaking from my personal experience at WEFMAX, I actually received a mentor or kind of kept in touch with a mentor, uh, Bill Davis. I, maybe some of you guys are familiar with him, but uh, he actually called me two days ago and just left me a voicemail like, hey, just wanted to let you know, like if you need any help from me, I saw you went to, I went to ACE and uh, you did a great job. Like you posted on LinkedIn, like just helping me through the process and making sure that um, I'm still very involved in the association. Um, so another thing that I don't know how I'm doing on time. I didn't look before I started, but uh, we can run through this and then we can maybe just talk about um, what we want to do during the breakout session. I think, um, sorry, Lauren, if I'm just jumping in, I just wanted to make sure we one of the biggest takeaways from the WEFMAX was like what we need to continue working on. And maybe we can talk just 
um, if you can just explain like what we want to focus on as a part of as a takeaway from this work mass. Yeah, so I think that the the biggest thing that we we wanted to focus on was the how do we get YPs to see the value and get them to not just come to one event, but continue to stay involved. And so I think that these two discussion points are really uh, trying to figure that out. I know we, we identified some hurdles and potential solutions, but continually uh, looking at different MAs and what they're uh, incorporating and how do what works the best, what hasn't worked, and um, just kind of learning and actually implementing those takeaways, I, I think was the biggest thing from the Charleston WFMAX. But I, I do know that personally with the South Carolina section, we changed a lot with our YPs and um, I don't wanna give away too much before the breakout session, but we, we've got them a lot more involved and plug in from the WFMAX. So I think it was very beneficial. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate your input. Um, I think after this, we've got um, Donnell Duncan. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, he is the Associate Vice President um, of Arcadis and he serves WEF um, as the speaker elect um, uh, for the House of Delegates and a co-chair um, for the Board of Trustees DEI Committee. Uh, he, he's also earned a diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace certificate from the University of South Florida um, and is a licensed professional um, in 27 states, which is incredible. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Donnell. Thank you so much, Nashida, and we appreciate all that uh, was done in the other sessions. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to give a quick recap of what happened in uh, the final WEFMAX, Fargo. And in the interest of time, I'll defer uh, as much time as I could to Juna Vas to talk about inclusive events. So just from a, a top line, uh, um, we first asked everyone to tell us how important the ENI is to their Emmys. And about 52% said that the ENI is relatively important in the ME, uh, medium level. And we started getting into rolling out our DEI toolkit. Took some time to do a deep dive into it, uh, ensuring that everybody knew that uh, DEI is not common knowledge. And the purpose of the toolkit is just to uh, spread some basic understanding to each of the uh, MEs that are interested in bringing DEI into what they are doing, uh, giving some level of uh, basic uh, starting points and some information to go along the way. We asked for some feedback from the MEs on uh, what has been happening pertaining to DEI in their MEs. So a few have already started subcommittees. Some have been using the toolkit, which has been really good. And we tapped into uh, some questions about DEI challenges that MEs are facing. And some of the comments that were made was that uh, keeping up the momentum and assigning volunteers. Uh, it's really great to start off with a bang, but how do you continue uh, the process? Some have talked about uh, their biggest challenge is developing events that are inclusive for all of their members. So. Uh, Joe is going to talk some more about that in a minute or two. And uh, we had a just a higher level question that we asked about feedback on WEF's communication uh, with these tools and toolkits that we create. And uh, the feedback we got was that they're not always the most accessible. And I, I like something that Jamie said earlier. Uh, with the new strategic plan, we're going to focus on the outcomes and not just on the tools and the things that we're passing out. So we are gonna be thinking about that even more as we uh, delve into the DEI aspect of what the organization is doing. 
we did a couple of brainstorming exercises uh, talking about understanding DE&I, uh, what does diversity mean to you? What does it mean to be included? Uh, and we let each of the participants share their thoughts. We got some really interesting insight uh, from Alaska. Alaska had a very unique perspective where two thirds of the population is in South Central Alaska. So getting uh, participation from members who are in more rural areas is a significant challenge, which is uh, very unique in, in, in terms of uh, the, the separation within Alaska from uh, some of the other Emmys that we were engaging. And we talked about the importance of uh, addressing the issues that are being faced. We did something called crowdsourcing solutions. So uh, someone mentioned a solution, a problem, and then we worked together to come up with some ideas for a solution. So for Alaska, we talked about, hey, let's focus on potentially making your in-person meetings hybrid to ensure that members who are unable to attend from more rural areas can get up an opportunity to participate. And then uh, we had Nebraska talk about some challenges with the timing for scheduling meetings. And we came up with some potential solutions, potentially vary the locations of the meetings and 30-minute uh, Zoom meetings to accommodate people who cannot attend. Uh, as long as we can work together, we can find ways to make things work. We had a presentation from uh, Ebony Green on organi organi organizing residents to prioritize and influence infrastructure in targeted communities. And we did some uh, practices uh, or shared some best practices on how you can get the community organized to address their own issues. And it was quite good, two examples that were used for uh, Ebony's presentation was the Proctor Creek watershed in the city of Atlanta, as well as the Atlanta brown fields that were turned to the Atlantic station, how they were able to help the community organize to have a seat at the table during uh, the development of those projects. And uh, thankfully, things worked out quite well in the end for that community. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a moment just to share some pictures so you can see a bit of what it looked like and then defer to Joe to tell you some specifics on what happened in our with Max Fargo. So here are some pictures that I'm going to share from the group, some group discussions. They went quite well. Our format was very interactive. We decided to do everything like workshops. We even had a little competition here uh, where you had to create a, a small boat out of foil that can carry the most coins. And we had to test it to see how many coins your boat could carry. Uh, very interesting way of just uh, making engineering fun. This was our group picture at the end. Thankful to all those who attended and participated. Uh, the group went for a run. One of the things that is great about Fargo, it's the weather was really nice uh, at the point in time that we were there. And a highlight were the giveaways that the North Dakota WEA provided. Uh, this is just a picture of a couple of the things. It was a wonderful package of giveaways. And we definitely wanna give credit to them for making us feel at home. Uh, and uh, we had um, Diego Rosso from the board to give a, a great presentation. And also there were tours at some uh, resort facilities in the area that the group went out to. We had dinner at this really nice brewery. So we got a chance to hang out with one another. And in the parking lot was this very interesting car that we thought we should take a picture of just a, as a reminder that we were there. And this is a nice bus that uh, gives you a free ride within uh, the uh, Fargo area 
uh, from one location to the next. So the group got a chance to take a picture on that bus, which was quite an interesting experience. So yeah, thanks to everyone that helped us and participated in that uh, gathering. And Joe is gonna talk a little bit more about some specifics that we worked on uh, during that session. Joe Navas is currently a project manager with McCarthy Building Company in Henderson, uh, Nevada. He is originally from Lincoln, Nebraska, Go Huskers, and graduated from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, with a BS in construction management. Joe currently is the leader of our DEI committee, and he is going to take it away now. Thank you very much. And to all that participated, and Joe, over to you. Awesome, thank you, Donnell. I think um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. Uh, the the event that Donnell created was just fantastic, and uh, it was super interactive. Like we all left there going like, "Wow, we just didn't get talked that uh, during presentations this whole time. We actually like got to do work and work on ourselves and work on our MA. So shout out to Donnell for. For putting that together. This is just one of the presentations where I got to talk at everybody. So just know that this is very few. Um, so you already you already heard about me. Uh, just this is the, the quick slide I have uh, just to, to, to highlight everything he already said. Probably the family is the only thing that didn't, didn't get mentioned there was very important to myself as well. Um, so what we talked about was at it, planning an inclusive MA event takes data collection, preparation, things at the event, uh, what's going on in the sessions, and then, you know, last but not least, your MA board support. So when you talk about data collection, we, we, we just pointed out the facts that, you know, if you don't really know what's going on at your conference, it's tough to make the right changes to make your, your, your uh, maybe, maybe not your conference or even your event, it's, it's tough to make it more inclusive, right? So how are you capturing that speaker data? How are you documenting paid versus non-paid speakers and, and their demographics? Um, so just something to really think about when you're when you're doing your own events and, and probably more specifically your your conferences. Uh, so preparation, preparation, preparation. I think we all understand that in the jobs we do. The more you prep, the more you plan, the better things go. So um, do you have a speaker policy? You know, determine you know any mini minimum representation you want. Uh, gender balance, the 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 groups that are underrepresented, underdeserved. Is there youth right? And then it was kind of an easy one, I think, for all of us is just this functional diversity, right? We have engineers, operators, contractors, other businesses, manufacturers, just whatever it is that is involved in the water industry. There's a lot out there that maybe isn't typically represented at WEP. So, and then obviously a geographical distribution. I think this is a this is an easy way to maybe include some other MAs that can shed light on on how to be more inclusive. And then don't forget, publicize that that policy. <laughs> once you have it. Um, you're going to get resistance, right? I think anybody that's kind of ventured down the DNI journey knows that there's going to be resistance. So expect to deal with the, we need quality or the best, um, emphasize the breadth of talent in the world. And I think this is, this is an awesome part of the conference where Donnell dived into um, his, his idea about a superiority complex that a lot of people have. And there's certainly not enough time here to talk about all that. So please join our breakout group. Maybe we'll dive into that. Um, but, but really what, what we're saying when we say the superiority complex is that you don't, you're, just because you're opening up your, your speaker policy, your presentation policy to more people, doesn't mean you're sacrificing quality. In fact, it could mean the opposite. Just the idea that, that those people aren't up to the same quality is that, it, is that superiority complex, right? That's not, that's not true at all. So when you hear that, stop it, stop it, stop it. So it's not right. Um, you know, we want that diversity of thought. Those people are probably going to be better anyways, because it's not going to be the same old ho-hum speaker that we've all uh, come to here anyway. So proposal submissions, cast a wider net, announce earlier. Also, hey, what lived experiences do you bring, right? Like that, that actually kind of separates the submissions sometimes. And then Will the, panel offer, will the panel offer scientific, intellectual, regional, political, ethnic, cultural diversity to the conference, right? That's a whole nother category of things that you can start to bring diversity into your events. And then, you know, fund the, fund the diversity fellowships, like 
pay the speaker's travel costs, right? Consider streamline application um, that where you encourage the unfamiliar folks uh, with submissions. And that, that's more or less like almost what we were talking about in the YP thing where people that have always done this have done this forever, just know how to get their presentations approved. You know, how do you make that, that application process more encouraging to unfamiliar folks? And then build a diverse speaker list. I think this, this is where you, you're actively kind of recruiting to that list. Maybe you can reach out to other MAs. Um, you can reach out to WEF certainly, but like, how do you, how do you build a diverse speaker list? One, one solution here too, is to keep back slots for newer people that are re recommended later. Um, you know, so, so, you know, you, you get everything filled out, but you have like those one or two little, little uh, spots where, you know, it's like, Hey, we're going to do something different and we're going to go find that, that right speaker for that. And then training. I know uh, a lot of us that are new, right? If we're talking about an emerging leader or just maybe somebody that's never presented at this type of a conference, hey, can we get some training for them? Sometimes it's maybe just a 30 minute session on this is a, this is a do, this is a don't, this is the way you do it. Um, but it's certainly gonna make your MA event more inclusive to, to folks that don't get this training through their organization. I'm super lucky they, they do that for me, right? But other, other organizations don't necessarily do this, so. Um, a, a balanced program committee, I think, is really important when you're talking about how to set up your event, right? So if you get if you get a if you're getting a, a program committee that just kind of is the same old same old, it's always been the same people that have always done it, and you're ending up with a certain type of uh, diversity that it, it, your DEI perspective isn't what it should be, right? Really consider about how to balance that committee, right? Because they're gonna they're going to figure out that those people are going to bring different solutions, different expectations, different views to that. And then even if that's not realistic, you could consider a review with a DNI lens. So maybe you have a DNI committee or just saying, Hey, let's just, let's just look at this program for diversity, equity, inclusion. Are we, are we doing the best we can? Marketing and visuals, huge. I think uh, there's, this is something that I think goes beyond even just WEF and, and MAs. This is really something that, um, any organization can work on, but really it's, you know, providing that guidance, the, the pronoun usage on, on what the vigil should look like, encourage the conference imagery is inclusive, right? I mean, if we're, set, if we're looking at our imagery, we're going to put out there, is it, are we portraying some sort of message that we don't intend to? Um, try not to use stock photos, right? This is, this is important because stock photos, I'm not sure how many people are aware, but they actually have a bias to them, you know, so as, as stock photos get clicked on and Google tracks who's clicking on the most ones and saving the, saving the most ones, well, it tends to be a bias towards one type of stock photo, right? So just be careful when you're doing that. And then WEF probably has photos, right? I mean, uh, WEF spent a lot of time to make sure that their, their marketing and visuals are, are you know, inclusive. So reach out, there's certainly help. So at the event, at the event, the fun stuff. Um, have an anti-harassment policy, right? Um, make sure it's, it's, there's a clear reporting process. Ensure that somebody is there from leadership, right? To respond if an incident happens and uh, adopt a code of conduct that clarifies expectations for attendees, speakers, vendors, et cetera, right? So um, have everyone sign it. I think this is an opportunity when you're signing up, right? This is when you sign up to the conference, like, hey, we have an anti-harassment policy acknowledged. Um, Support caregivers. Um, we st I see this in the Vegas airport or not. That's where that's where I'm located. They start that they're starting to have like wellness rooms for for caregiver, care caregivers for mothers, even little prayer rooms for for people that need to uh, take take time and do that. So just think about that. Um, most places will accommodate that or have a way to accommodate that. And if they don't, maybe that's not a place that you want to have your conference at. Right? Um, they're not totally being inclusive. So um, there's a funny quote here. If you're spending money on an open bar rather than childcare, you might want to reconsider your approach. <laughs> I think we all know uh, that lots of money gets spent in an open bar and that's okay. Just, you know, maybe you could make it a little more equal or at least bring up that childcare part of it a little bit more. And then ad advocate for gender, gen gender equity at scientific conferences. Um, that's one thing that tends to happen a lot if you're talking about more of a scientific field. Um, so, uh, underrepresented groups. So 
touch on this a little bit, the prayer rooms, gender neutral bathrooms, uh, it, you know, you don't have to make all of the bathrooms in there gender neutral, just have one or two that's general neutral, right? Um, ensure all the events don't revolve around alcohol. Um, and then leadership commitment, right? I mean, that's a huge part of anything that actually results in change or a better way of doing things is, is that leadership needs to be responsible and attend and, and really support those underrepresented groups and events. New attendees, um, back to almost the same message from the emerging leadership, right? It's, it's those opportunities for new attendees to meet and engage with leaders, right? It's, how are we doing that? How are we making that happen? Is there a, can we, can we have a specific event for that? Um, breakfast, mentorships, guidelines, best practices. So, so really think about how you make your new attendees feel welcome. Um, and then accessibility, we all know, we all think about probably like ADA access, things like that, but what about, you know, the visually impaired or, or maybe the neurodivergent folks? So just thinking about how to make, thinking about all the accessibility and what can you do to be better at your event. In the session, moderators, I'm sure a range of female and racially diverse moderators as well as speakers, right? Because th there's a, and, and I probably have it in here, but I'll just touch on it because I know I'm trying to get through this quick, um, is when you think about who the moderator is, it really affects the people that are going to ask questions or the quest type of questions that are asked, right? So you don't end up with the full experience of that presentation or the conference if you have, you know, the same type of moderator in every single uh, session. So, you know, be intentional about that. Um, there's also, uh, it's, actually it's right here, when the session chairs were asked to take a question from a woman or early career uh, researcher first, it visibly changed the dynamic of the Q&A sessions, right? Awesome thing to think about and just train your moderators on that, right? And uh, anonymously, QR codes, right? Those work great as well. So um, just some ideas. And then this is the, the some alternative formats, Slido, Mentimeter, I'm sure a few of you have used this, right? Um, it, it, it just helps people ask questions and it also provides a software that maybe, you know, mitigates that unconscious bias that somebody might have that's in the room, right? Because we all can recognize we all have an unconscious bias, so. And then last but not least, uh, you know, we need to have the board support, right? So, you know, take that pledge with your, with your board, um, you know, make sure that the board is on board with everything that we're that we're saying and that we want to do. Um, I think you know none of this becomes a reality. You know, your your events will not become more inclusive without that support. So, uh, just just last but not least, make sure that that everybody's on on board there, uh, and I'm sure they would be. So, that's it. All right, right thanks for that, Joe. In the breakout, yeah. we'll send it on to. Uh, the breakouts. All good information, everyone. Never enough time. Great. Well, with our last couple of minutes here, um, I, I just wanted to encourage the scribes from each of the breakout rooms to please uh, uh, type in your two to three key takeaways in the chat box here before we all leave. But um, also just wanted to kind of close us out and just say say thank you to everyone again for attending. Um, I know I, uh, uh, I mentioned I wasn't able to make any of the in-person WEF maxes this year. So it was really helpful to hear um, the takeaways from Hawaii, Charleston, and Fargo. Um, I, I appreciate this format too. I think as we talk about diversity and inclusion, one of the things we did learn um, through our last couple years of surviving the pandemic has been that um, while we, we miss the face-to-face -face, um, and there's certainly still a need for that, um, that having these virtual opportunities to connect really allows us to reach a broader and more diverse group, um, especially those whose um, jobs or family situations don't allow them to travel um, or, or may not have the seniority in their organizations to be able to uh, go, go to the conferences and things like some of the rest of us do. 
So um, I encourage everybody to stay in touch. You know, we're uh, several months here from our next WEFMAX meeting when we can all get back together. Um, but with any of the connections that you've made from the in-person meetings, from the virtual, um, or even through WEFCOM, um, please just continue to reach out to each other and help support. I, again, when I was in MA leadership, I know how uh, valuable the relationships that I had made with other MA leaders at WEFMAX, at WEFTEC, and those events um, really helped me through, um, especially my year as president, trying to get some init initiatives off the ground. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, we can all get together again here October 9th through 12th in New Orleans. So I hope to see everybody at WEFTEC. So thank you all. I appreciate, uh, appreciate your time today and uh, enjoy seeing everybody. Thanks, James. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.